Yeah, I'm probably here to, to be speaking at uh, Code Harbour. Um, a bit about me. So I'm a technical architect at Beanley, where I'm responsible for architecting how we build our site to be responsive. Um, specifically using techniques that adapt the site uh, to be performant and um, to be re re reusable code. So I've written a book cover called Beginning Responsive Design, and I regularly contribute to open source, including some State Manager, EchoJS, and the Financial Times uh, Playful Service. I also use Twitter a bit too much. <laughs> so the heart of every progressive web app is a responsive site. It's built to be mobile first, focusing on how things fit on a small screen first, progressively enhancing for, for large displays to provide a fuller experience. However, the techniques used to build mobile first sites are the same we've been using for over a decade. We're still floating our elements left, we're still setting heights on elements that need to be equal height, and to vertically line something, we're either using a, t a horrible t table CSS hack or absolutely positioning. And, and, but what browsers have been busy implementing new features that enable us to build better sites and, and have a lot more fun while doing it. So today, what we're going to do is look at ways that we can build better responsive sites in 2016 using these new features. So first up, we're going to look at our site content because obviously the content is the heart of our site. So what I want to do is, 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 is uh, take through a quote from uh, Bobby Anderson, uh, who I quote way too often. Um, so this content is king. It always has been and always will be. Content is why we use visit your site, subscribe to your newsletters, and follow you on social media. Content is the single most important aspect of your website. So what Bobby's quote is telling us is that when we're starting a project, we should be prioritizing time to prepare and optimize our content. And content must work across a wide variety of devices, so it needs to be worked responsibly. And if we, uh, this was... April, so um, if we look at statistics, um, the device usage, 54% of users are still on desktop, but a whopping 41% of users on, on, on mobiles and 5% on tablets. But uh, these global statistics, so where possible, don't rely on them. You should look at your own site's usage stats. So if you look at the Beanly websites, for, for example, about 91, 92% of our users are on mobile, so um, it does vary a lot. Um, so one of the things you should be doing when building a response site is to audit your site content. An audit of your content is simply an inventory of what you want to include in your page. The audit of our content needs to be done before you start UX design. So you need to, you need to be doing it at the fourth uh, of your project. So J Jeremy Gerard uh, said this content is much better than me. So uh, starting a response design without content is like creating packaging for a design without a product. You can do your best but who knows if the end content of the product will truly fit into what you create. And you should be including your stakeholders in the auditing pro process. And this, this is the most difficult part, because these may be your clients or outside your business. Um, these are your designers who want to make things look pretty. Uh, and these are your, your, pro your project managers who just want to get the job done. So how you determine the content we want to include in our site, we'll now look how we can prioritize it uh, and, uh, in the way we display it to our user. So content does not need to be in the same order on every device. Typical responsive techniques you see content prioritization being considered as an overall piece, rather than the context of individual device types. In reality, when users are trying to achieve when on your site, it's likely to differ based on the type of device they're using. So we're going to look at an example of a restaurant. So in, in practice, on, on a restaurant, I, I'm, I'm on my phone, I actually want to be able to get in contact with that restaurant, so I want, I want to find the phone number first. Then I want to perhaps look at how I get there. So I, I, I want to look at um, the address or even directions. And then I might want to make a booking. So Because normally when I'm using my mobile phone, I'm looking at a restaurant, I'm, I'm, I'm out and about. So, but on a large device, I'm, I'm actually plan normally planning ahead. So I'm, I'm, I'm sat at the desktop at work or I'm at home. Um, on my laptop, so I, I, I want to start looking at atmosphere. I want to find somewhere that, that I want to take my wife on a date. Um, also, the next thing is like menu. I want to see what kind of food they offer. So, uh, take for example, my my son, he's got celiac disease. So, if I um, well, I'm planning to go out, I want to look at that menu to see they they offer something that he can eat. Then, after I've decided that I like this place, I then want to make booking. Uh, then, then, then I might use the phone number to, to find out more information, and then directions to get there. So I apologise for my design skills, I'm not a designer, um, but this is how I look on mobile. So um, we, have, we have the phone number in the header, 
Then we've got two calls to actions for both how to get there and then booking a table. Then we lower down the page, we, have, we still have the menus and the atmosphere, but it's low, low priority. And this is how it, how it transforms to larger devices. So we're leading with big, bold imagery that's, that portray the atmosphere of, 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 the, um, of the restaurants. Then, we, uh, then because we were in the um, West Leaf, rest, we'd left to right, we've got the menu, then the booking, then the directions. So to reorder content based on the type of device, what we can do is use a combination of CSS Flexbox and media queries. So th this, this is an example of, of, of a piece of content where we have some that's more, more important for mobile and some that's more important for desktop. I'll, I'll solve these by the classes. Um, then, so we, have, what we, did, we did, we had a wrapper. So, so, we, so for our, um, oh sorry, was, we have our mobile content first because we're, on, we're, we're developing for mobile devices, but a mobile first and then our desktop content. So then we do media queries to target the bigger devices. Um, we have a wrapper which sets display flex, and, and because we want the content to act upon one another, it's flex direction column. Then we, we, we specify the order using the order property on both the best content for desktop and the best content for mobile. Aside from looking at how you should be prioritizing content, you should also be looking at how you ensure the content is discoverable across a wide variety of devices. On large devices, navigating a site is often really easy. If we take a look at the Sony site, for example, it has a very clear navigation covering the key areas of the business. And if we can't see what they want to provide, provide us, we can search for the content. Unfortunately, on small devices, navigation becomes a lot less obvious. We had, we had the advent of the, of the hamburger menu. So, uh, looking at Sony site mobile, you notice the navigation is completely hidden. In addition, it's not clear that the search box has also been moved to the hamburger menu. So by moving, what we can do though, is we can move those key, those key items outside of the hamburger menu. And, and, and it gives us multiple benefits. So first they've been able to remove the hamburger menu completely and replace it with the, with, with the search icon. So all that stuff is visible to the user straight away. In addition, when the users actually arrive on the site, um, the menu actually gives them context of what the site is about. So uh, from, when visiting the site now, I, I can see that they have a store, that this is electronics, and it's an entertainment company. Uh, so so it, it's, it's already got a number of benefits. Also, I, can, I don't have to do two clicks to find the electronics page. The compromise, of course, is that content is pushed down slightly, but the user experience is better uh, overall, so, so it's, it's definitely something to consider. Large devices also, also have more space for content, but, just, but you shouldn't be hiding content complete, completely. This means in, in particular on small devices, we, should not, we shouldn't hide content because there's not enough space. An example of this is the GLH site, where we have this big, bold map on, on large devices, but simply the address on, on small devices. What they could have done is had a thumbnail of that map next to the address, which when clicking on it, um, would, would show a bigger map or say you go out to your maps app. Uh, hiding content in this way is actually quite deceptive to your users because they, they're often coming from search engines. So if they come, to, if they come from um, Google and, they, and, and, and the search snippet has said this piece of content and then they come to a page and can't find it, it, it's a very frustrating experience. So instead you should be thinking of ways which can change functionality to better suit your device. So ha having prioritised our content and considered how to ensure it was responsive, we now, we, now, we now need to look at how we lay out our site. So responsive design has led to us building our components to be, be fluid, enabling our components to scale to different device sizes that we're able to support. We want, we, we want to support a 320 pixel width iPhone 4 to a, a huge iMac screen. But until recently, we've only been able to do this by resorting to hacks. So let, let's, let's have a look, look at a few ways that we can do this using Flexbox. So input atoms. So this is where you have a, a, a you might have a, fl a fluid width component, which is which consists of both an input field and a button. Um, with Flexbox, what we can do is we can have a div that wraps both the input and the button, and then the button. The, well, if we set the input wrap to be display flex, what will, will happen is that the, the the button and the, the the button will take up its natural width, and by applying flex one to the input field it will then take up the writing space. Um, this is one that should be in from CSS from the beginning, be able to align something vertically. Um, so the, 
I think it's self-explanatory, but it's content on site, I put it in the center of the screen. So to do this, we can again use Flexbox. We can, uh, so we have like an aligner element for, around the content, uh, again set display flex, and then we've told it that we're to align the item center and justify the content center. Then we have this align content, so just with the Flexbox definition, it's, it's already in the center of the page, vertically. But what will happen is the, um, because it's quite a long piece of text, it'll actually fill, fill the width of the page, so it's, so you don't get this really, really long line. So what you, I've done here is I've, I've said maps width 50, so that's say how you get that effect of being in the middle. Cool. A sticky footer. So this, this, is, this is the case where you might have a, a, long, a, a short page, that you want the, but it looks strange if the footer sits right beneath the content. So you want it to sit at the at flush of the bottom of the page. This used to be uh, if you ha like hacked around min height and stuff, but now what you can do is you can use Flexbox again. So on the body, uh, I've added a class called site, which, set, which, has, which, which has CSS defined its display flex, min height of 100 VH, so VH is a percentage of the viewport height. Uh, I, 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 because my content header, some header main content and footer are stacked upon one another, we set the uh, flex direction to column. And then the, the margin, the margin to zero, because we don't want any margin on the body in this case. Then we um, then the, 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 we set the site contents to flex one, so it will take up any remaining content. So the header will take up its default height, the footer will take up its default height, and then remaining space is taken up by the site content. So it pushes the footer down. Grids. So grids are really popular, and just things like Twitter Bootstrap use them. But they use, but they, they they all have one thing in common. They quite often are using um, float left and clear fixes to show the content. But now with uh, Flexbox, what you can do is you can now melt now build easy to use grids. So this is a sample grid. So uh, we have a we have our um, outer grid row, uh, and then inside we have the um, the individual cells. So the grid is set to display flex. And the grid cell is, is set to flex one, because uh, all the um, the grid cells are set to, set to flex, flex one in this example. The the, the devices the the, the the space available is divided proportionally, so both those cells are the same width. But obviously, you, not all your, your grid cells are all going to need to be the same size. So quite often, you might have like this this top row where you have a half width co uh, column, and then you have two smaller columns. And what you can do is you can literally say that that particular uh, cell is 50% is, is of the width, and then the other cells will, will automatically fill, fill the rest of the space proportionally. So ha ha having done all this content optimization, it's very important to, to me measure its success, because you're, while I can give you a, a, a set of recipes to take away, I, 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 I can't say how, exactly how your, all your users react to, to different things you, you do. So, the first thing you need to do is invite your users into the office and have them test your site. And asking them to test your site, you can measure their response to how they adapt your content. And you don't have to build an interface up front to do this, you can just take them through your wireframes. Another thing you can do is something called guerrilla user testing. So this is where you go out into the streets and ask people to test your site. So when I've done this before, I've, I've offered a five pound gift voucher to Starbucks in exchange for person's time. I actually did this in Starbucks. I just spoke to the manager and they let me, let me, they let me, let me speak to the, their customers and test my, my site. And I actually got this, we, because we'd, we'd already done normal use testing, I was able to compare the results and they, they, were, they were actually identical and it was significantly cheaper to do it this way. Another way in which you can measure the success is after you've gone live. So live, you can start A-B testing. So you can, have multiple, you can implement multiple different versions of a component and then you sh then different users are shown different versions, um, and then you you can you can you can use tools like uh, Google Experiments to me measure the success of each component, and it'll it'll give you it'll give you the statistical um, significance of it'll 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 keep testing until it reaches statistical significance of whether a component A or B is better at reaching your end goal. So our in summary of our content, content is king. And with approximately 46% of our users not using a desktop browser, we need to be ensuring the content is optimized for all different device types. I'll say, how did this, this, this slide is from a conference. It was Jake Archibald's birthday. So mm -hmm. I, I give us a slide that I made just him. But it's got, it's got kids, so it's okay. So having looked at the content of our site, we now look, look how, 
look at the site performance because we want to develop, deliver that content to our users as fast as possible. It's 2016, but still, there's still a number of users that are either on 2G or 3G connections. So there are three key types of performance that are important to a website. Render performance. This is the time it takes the browser to start rendering the page. Uh, so that's until it starts, um, starts being white. Then we have page load performance. So this is the time it takes for the page to be fully loaded uh, and fully interactive. So that's where all your assets downloaded, JavaScript downloaded, etc. And then we have perceived performance. So this sits, sits in somewhere in between the two. This is, this is the perception the user, the user gets about the performance of your site when they visit it. And that's the more important one. So this is a video of the Guardian site. So what you'll see is at four seconds it starts to render. And the user can start around the content, but it's at seven seconds that when the images have come in, that the, that website fe feels like it's loaded. So you, I can start browsing the site, find the articles I'm interested in. Um, so yeah, that's our perceived performance. But as you can see, it's actually still loading. Um, so this video was on a slow 3G connection using web page test, and you'll see at 32 seconds, the site finally loads and our adverts come in. And we all love waiting for adverts. So why should I care about performance as a site? So a responsive site is expected to work on a wide variety of internet connections. A user can be sat in the office at work on a really fast connection, or out in the countryside loading the site on a 2G connection while they're sat in their tent. And from a financial point of view, it can have a huge effect on your business. So Amazon found uh, every 100 milliseconds of delay in loading a page cost them 1% of sales. So um, the, best statistic, the best data I could get was 2014, Amazon revenue totaled $89 billion. So 1% of that would be $900 million. So I think that's no small change for them. Uh, and then Google found an extra 500 milliseconds delay in loading their social results, decreased traffic by 20%. So that's 20% less adverts they could show. So the trend however, the past few years, however, is pages are increasing in weight. So average page weight has been increasing year on year. Um, in 2013, we were looking at um, 1,411 kilobytes for the average page. But now in, in April 2016, we're looking at 2,296 kilobytes. Yes, the average page weight is now bigger than Doom. The entire game is, is excusable, the images and everything. It's crazy. And if we look at industry averages, we can see that the, the uh, biggest culprits for increasing our page size, it, 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 it contributes to page size, is, is images. So on average, uh, a website has 1.35 meg of images um, and 354 kilobytes of JavaScript. And the average time to start rendering is also increasing. So in between March 2014 and August 2015, the time to start rendering increased by 48%. Which is crazy when, connect, when, when we're living in a time where our internet connection is getting faster, our devices are getting faster, but apparently developers are getting worse at performance. Mm -hmm. um, so what steps can I take to improve site performance? Uh, so the number of steps you can take to improve site performance. The first of which is create a performance budget. So this is where you need to get your stakeholders back involved. They need to be involved in like, planning what, what compromises you have to make when you build the site. So a performance budget is the budget applied to the file sizes of your assets or page users based on the connection speed of our users, along with the maximum time we want our page to take to load. So Tim Cadillac explains the reason we want to do this really well. The, performance, the purpose of a performance budget is to make sure you focus on performance throughout the project. The reason you go through the trouble in the first place, though, is because you want to build a site that feels fast for your visitors. So at the start of your project, you need to understand what metrics you want to achieve. And, and, we can do, and then we use these metrics as, 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 as a basis for our budgets. So this, the, 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 this example is actually based on what we're doing at Beanley. So as building a responsive site, uh, to, to today's example, we want to, we want to start rendering our, our, our site in five seconds on a slow 3G connection. We saw earlier that the Guardian site is doing it in 4.2 seconds, so that's not too unreasonable. So to, 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 to start with, we need to define slow 3G. Yeah, we need to start to define slow 3G. So web page test defines this as 96 kilobytes per second. It, web page test is a trusted source, so I'm happy to go with this as our connection speed. So as we want to load our site in five seconds, uh, we, do, we multiply the 96 kilobytes by five seconds, that's 480 kilobytes needed before, before we can start rendering. So we can then split the, that 480 kilobytes across our assets. Um, so these, these figures were for a, these, these figures were for a article page, 
So there's quite a lot of text, so that's why the HTML is quite heavy. Um, it's quite a dynamic article, so it's quite a bit of CSS, CSS and JavaScript. And then obviously you've got articles have big imagery. Um, but then if you want to, then, it, then my designer comes along and says, I need web fonts, because web fonts make my, my type look great. Um, then we have to then work it into our budget. So here I've sacrificed 60k of images for 60k of fonts. So these figures seem, seem quite ambitious, ambitious if you compare it back to those industry averages we looked earlier. But it's very achievable. Um, we're, achieve, we're, achieve, we're achieving these at Beamly. And, and um, th th this, is this, is this is for the perception of your site. So you, um, af after the, the users perceive they pay the page fast, you can spend ages downloading whatever you want in the background. So uh, if you want to calculate your own budget, there's a website I built called performancebudget.io. <laughs> Um, which you can just yeah you you, you, you basically you set you enter the um, speed the, the time you 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 enter the, the, the speed and then it'll give you a, it'll give you a um, a maximum account and then you can then do some sliders that allow you to select to select what what you want to prioritize in your budget. So the things the simple things to do is optimize how we render our assets. So this this includes loading our images that are necessary. So the first thing to do is provide different images for different viewport sizes using picture elements. Um, if you mean, I don't know if you've, you've been following it, but uh, Safari, Safari in, in iOS 9.3 onwards now supports picture elements, so that's all the mobile dev devices now support it in, the, in their main browser. So it, it, you, you're, you're very safe to use this. And the reason it makes sense to use a picture element is it doesn't make sense to load a 1,000 pixel wide image on a 5 pixel maximum screen size of 320 pixels. And so that's where the picture element comes in. And it's not about just the amount of data you're downloading, it's actually the decompressed size when the, image, the, the, the device turns it into a bitmap, not to render. So, the, so this is a picture element. It consists of the picture um, wrapping it, and then multiple source elements, and then an image element. So, we at least eat, so what, what the browser does, it goes through each of these, the, element, the, uh, the source elements to see if it's got a, a media expression that matches, which is the media attribute. If it, if it matches, it stops and uses that as the image. Otherwise, it falls back to, fat, back to the image at the end. In browsers that don't support, support um, picture elements, uh, what will happen is you'll just get the last Im image, which is going to be normally the worst quality one, so we normally use a picture, uh, the, the polyfill to, to fix that. So this is an example of working. So that's the church I got married in a few years ago. Okay. So yeah, as, as, as the browser gets bigger, um, they, the, the browsers are then going fetching from the network the, the, the bigger image. Um, browsers pull the picture elements will only download the image that the browser needs. Um, so this is the browser supports at the moment. <coughs> cool. So aside from using the picture element, we can also choose to defer the loading of both image and video to improve the, the initial page load. So most common content to defer loading is images. So, so, so this, this is the, the Guardian site. Um, as, as I scroll down the page, uh, the, 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 they've, they've got the spaces where the image should be because they, 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 load, they load them after the page is loaded using JavaScript. They're actually, they're actually quite clever in the way they do this in that the first few images in the page are in the page, and then it, so that when you, the perceived perception that is that you've got some images available quickly, but then it's not until you start scrolling down that you start downloading stuff. So, so the browser is prioritizing images that are, are available first. In, case, in cases where we're loading assets is, is deferred, though, it's important that we do something to ensure to, to, to place holes in place. So yeah, the Guardian site uses blank space. Some websites use loading spinners. So if, if your images are taking a while to load, you, get, you, you still get that, that good experience. And in, in deferring loading of content, content so only, only images are visible are contribute to that page budget. So simply deferring loading assets isn't a new thing. A lot of websites are doing it these days. But what is less common is to defer the loading of our content. So the content is the heart of the site, and we discussed, as we discussed earlier, but, but it's not all content is created equal. Let's have a look at the example on the Metro site defers the loading of related content. So as you'll see, on, on this mobile device, as you scroll down, um, more and more content loads. And, and basically, you get, you get an infinite list of related content. But on, on, on large devices, obviously, you have a second column for where that related content goes. So, um, but they, they don't include that in the initial page. Um, I, I, I captured this by turning JavaScript off. Uh, and then using JavaScript, they pull, they pull in niche content. So the content in this case is, 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 is must-read articles. Um, 
that they're, tr they're trying, to get you, trying to get you to look at. Deferred content in this way prevents the browser from loading content in the case that is never shown to the user. But there is a big danger of this, and that is that if JavaScript fails to load for whatever reason, the content that is deferred will not be loaded. So should the user the, your user enter a train station, uh, the tube station, the, the or 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 a tunnel, um, or something just lose connection, you they, they, they lose content. So this is an example of, of um, how not to do it. So the talk to business site is a prime example where too much content has been deferred. That I, I, I when JavaScript fails to load, you get no content. It feels very empty. So we should therefore be careful when the with what content we're choosing to fill that in. The biggest advantage of deferring content is that we're able to reduce the size of what we need to deliver to the user. So this goes back to that performance budget. So we're able to deliver less HTML to, 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 to get the users to think that the page is snappy. So in summary, so building a progressive web app is much more about building a site that works across mobile, tablet, and desktop. It's much more than simply adding a manifest to your page so that it can be installed or using a service worker. It's about adapting the user experience for a site that, regardless of the device, user gets the best experience possible. So, prioritizing content and um, making it load fast. And so, when building a progressive web app, you should spend time focusing on content and performance. Our content should be prioritized and discoverable, and the but most importantly, is the, the perception of our users that, be, that your site loads fast. So, I did, my Flexbox examples were based on Sold by Flexbox. Um, thank you for everyone, uh, for thank my wife and Kate at work for helping me. Kate always checks on my slides for me. And I've, and, so, and there's all these, these, these slides and loads of notes to go with this talk are all available on my blog. 